husband if if your husband died and the way you die with your husband is is as he's being lit on the funeral pyre which most Indians don't use f funeral pyres anymore to to bury the dead um, and um, the lady can run and jump onto the pyre and die with her husband as the, as the fires are going up well as where she was from they didn't actually have pyres in the middle of the village where you could consume the dead so what she did was sort of a modernization modification of it and she took gasoline and poured it on her head and then lit it and tried to burn herself um, and kill herself that way to honor her husband and she did not succeed and so she woke up sometime later uh, in a hospital room and of course she had extreme burns all over her body and uh, a couple of ladies came by and visit her every day and after a period of months getting to know these two ladies who came to see her and cared for her uh, she was mo she was interested in what motivated them to come and they were motivated by Christ and so uh, a certain day came along and they said well you want to hear more about Christ that we've been telling you about we're gonna have a three-day meeting if you'd like to attend and you'll get to hear a lot and you'll get to meet a lot of other Christians too and and that's when we met her it was on that was when she came to those meetings so anyway that's um, that that's an example of widow burning that do, that takes place and uh, still takes place um, if you look in the rural areas of the countryside but uh, I just thought I'd share that with you to let you know that you know the, uh, the, the examples we gave are actually extreme, extreme examples, and oftentimes extreme exa examples can foster difference and, uh, and a lack, and it helps you, it doesn't help you to appreciate other cultures <laughs> when, when, you, when you tell stories like that. But, you know, the, the truth be told, there are some things about other cultures that aren't great. <laughs> there are things about our culture that aren't great, too. Uh, and this is a stream, extreme example, and it, but it does happen. And, and, the, and, and I also wanted you to see how, how this lady came into contact with Christ, too, and how it led her to have hope and see that there's a different way of life that superseded her culture in this case. So anyway, that's the story. Now I want to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he is my brother, Joey Barrier, Joseph Barrier. <laughs> And uh, Joey completed his, his Master of Divinity here at Heritage Christian University. And our, he was our first graduate in that program. So we're very pleased by that and happy to have, have uh, him to speak to us. Uh, Joey is married to Anna. Uh, he's been involved in uh, ministry here in the area and youth ministry and associate ministry, family ministry for about 15 years or, or so. I guess more than that, 18 years. <laughs> And uh, also involved in full-time uh, mission work, traveling back and forth to Asia. We work alongside our father and our mother, Wayne and Janet Barrier. And so we get to work together at, uh, at, at that level, too. And so we get to travel together at different times. And it's always um, it's a real pleasure to me to be able to travel with Joey. Uh, Joey's uh, my best friend, and, um, and he's my brother two things it is possible to be both at the same time <laughs> so anyway that's a real blessing to me to uh, share a friendship with him now um, as we continue to be able to do the work together so I'm excited to hear some of the things that he has to say and um, I'll turn it over to you Joey thank you Jeremy That's, that is from a youth rally that we had last year. I'm using some of, let me, is that off? I don't know. All right. I'm using some of the, the slides from that, and then I've added some uh, to it, uh, if you're confused about what go is. But it's, it's very appropriate for this too because we're talking about going we're talking about going all over the world um, <clears throat> uh, Jeremy talked about the, the, 
the widow burning. There, there are some places where we go uh, where uh, the, the churches uh, have been just ripped apart because of the issue of drinking blood. And that's why we put that on there. One of those places was Burma. We went there and uh, we were having a little question and answer period, which is real scary to do when you're in a, in a foreign country with a completely different culture and there's all kinds of different things that they're dealing with. Uh, to, for example, uh, some countries like the idea of, is it okay to put a Christmas tree up in your house? That could split a church. Um, and churches have been split over that. So that's nothing to us, nothing at all. A lot of us wouldn't think twice about that. Well, one day they ask us, is it okay to, to drink this certain type of soup, soup that they drink in Burma where they, where they drain all the blood out of a uh, pig? And then they cook it. And uh, I had never been asked that. I, never, I had never even thought about it. Now, there's some passages about that. But how many of y'all have spent time looking at those passages? Like, really thinking about that? Especially you younger guys. Has it ever crossed your mind? And so that, that's kind of what, what we're talking about all this. There's so many different things in different cultures. Um, and there's other things in cultures. I'm going to kind of transition into what I'm talking about. Uh, different parts of, of cultures that uh, are real good. And then there's things that are bad. And some of the places that we go, uh, Christianity is illegal. Sometimes uh, what we do can be dangerous. Uh, I remember one time uh, Jeremy was getting on a plane to head to Vietnam. I may have said this last time. I, I can't remember. But anyway, he was, he was getting on a plane to head to Vietnam, and the American brother that was there teaching in the school that Jeremy was going to, the school that was being held in a hotel room, uh, because that's the only place they could do it without, without getting caught or trying not to get caught. This is a big run-on sentence. But anyway, the, the American brother who's teaching there was being shipped out, uh, run on, put onto a bus, and sent straight to the airport because soldiers were coming up through there, or police were coming up into the building because they had caught on to them. So the guy at the front desk had called up to the room and said, hey, they're coming up, y'all better get out of there. Is, am, I, am I being clear with this story? So he runs out. He runs out the back door. The Christians there help him get out. They put him on a bus send him straight to the airport, and he's flying home. Meanwhile, Jeremy's getting on a plane, heading to this place to teach the next week of school. It can be dangerous. Uh, if they had caught that guy, I don't know what would happen to him. I don't know. I know what happens to the Christians there. They get thrown in jail. They get thrown in jail for a long time. Every one of those Christians in Vietnam has done some jail time. And... Uh, and uh, they've been through, through some pretty, pretty hard things. Uh, this last time in China, uh, we, we arrived. It was me and Andrew Sutherland, the guy with the white hair that was here a while ago, the white hair that's standing up. We, we, uh, we show up. We had done several schools, uh, sessions there in, in uh, Dolly City, China. Everything went great. This year we get off the plane. I can tell something's wrong by the look of Luke's face. He's our Chinese brother. He's got Chinese uh, papers and, and uh, Burmese papers. Uh, he's got dual citizenship. Uh, we meet him there, and I can tell something's wrong. I say, is everything okay? And he said, let's talk about it in the room. So we go back to the hotel room. Uh, we, we get to the hotel room. He looks around, closes all the doors, shuts all, all the windows, makes sure nobody can overhear anything. I think we're, we're fairly safe at this point, but he just wants to make sure he says the school is shut down. He said last year when y'all were here, three women were baptized. And I was kind of scared about this, but, but uh, they, they felt it was safe to do this. But we had to go to a public pool to do this because there's no bathtub at the hotel. There's no other body of water that we could find that wasn't absolutely freezing cold. It was water running off the Himalaya Mountains. So we go to this, this uh, swimming pool. It's a hot spring. So it's nat natural hot water coming out of the, the mountain. And uh, so these three women are baptized there. 
Me and Andrew are way off to the side. We don't even look at them while they're doing this. Uh, we want to make sure that nobody places us uh, together with this scene here. Uh, but they took pictures of it. They thought it was fine. You know, they, they thought everything, this is safe. This is okay to do. But we're not in any of those pictures. But the pictures that we are in are pictures of us after the, the school session is over. We had met in a hotel room for three or four days. We all got a picture together. You know, we're friends now. We know each other. We've eaten together every night. We want to remember this. We took pictures. I show those pictures in my slide presentation. They took pictures. They go home and they tell their friends, hey, guess what? Guess what I learned about? Guess who I learned about? I learned about Jesus Christ. I learned all these great things in the Bible. These American brethren came and they told us all this stuff. We didn't know anything about this. See, there's a lot of people in, in this area of China that know about God, but they just don't know much, much about Him. They know that there is a God. They've been taught by their grandparents because of some missionaries that had come through there a long time ago. But they've been taught by their grandparents, there's a God. But other than that, they don't know much about Him. They couldn't tell you about His Son, Jesus Christ. They couldn't tell you how to be saved. They didn't have their own Bibles to look and tell you that. So when, when these American brethren came and told them all this stuff, they were so excited about it. That's why they went to the water. That's why when they go back home, they're telling their friends about it. That's why they're showing them the pictures. Look, you know, here's the group that went down there. This friend tells somebody else. They tell somebody else. They tell somebody else. It finally gets to somebody that doesn't need to know that. It gets to the authorities. A couple of days later, those Christian women have soldiers standing at their front door, knocking on the door. Have you been down to Dolly City? Have you been near any Americans? We know that you've done this. We heard about it. Apparently, they don't have the pictures themselves, and maybe they got rid of the pictures. I don't know. But anyway, they said, we can't prove this. We can't prove that you're meeting up with Americans and studying the Bible with them. But if you do it again, we're going to get you. If you leave this city, we're going to follow you. We're going to find you, and we're going to find this thing. And that's when we show up. That's when we show up and we say, where are the students? They said, no school. No school. If we had had that school session, guess what would have happened? They would have followed them. Every city that they came from, all the 15 students that were going to come, there would have been somebody from that city following them. And they would have closed in on us when we were having that session. So the question is, why do you want to go there? Why do you want to do that? You know, really? You want to go there? Well, let's look at why we want to go there. And some of you have seen these numbers. These numbers have stayed the same in the past few years. There's $1.6 billion that are put in the collection plate every year from the church in the United States. This is just what we're doing. Uh, this, so it could be better if other churches in other countries are given, but... Most places in the rest of the world, the church is not as strong. Do you all agree with that statement? There's not as much money. Now, there are some countries that are, but the majority of the rest of the world, not so much. But what we're putting is $1.6 billion in the collection plate. Out of that, $340 million is spent on mission work. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. And the reason I say it's not a lot is because of... The next number right here, there are 7.2 billion people on the earth. I think it's 7.3 now, depending on where you look at that. $340 million has to cover 7.2 billion. All of a sudden, your number gets kind of small. Does that make sense? Um, now, let's, now let's look at the urgency of this. 144,000 people die every single day. 144,000 people die. In the hour that I'll be up here talking, maybe a little less than an hour, but anyway, 6,000 people will pass from this earth never having heard the gospel. Urgency. If we're going to try to get to all those people before they die, we need to get there now, right? We need to get there fast. Let's give ourselves a year. 
Let's say we've got a year to get to that person. Think of all the, the people who have died, the 52 million people that die in that year. We're going to lose them. But let's try to get to everybody else within a year. You've got less than five cents per person to get to that person in a year. Does that make sense? Are we all on the same page here? If you're going to spread it out and be effective and not leave anybody out, not leave a single person out on this earth, you've got five cents. That's difficult. That's a hard thing to do. And that's really what we're trying to talk about here is how can we make our money go further? What are some ways that we can do that? Manpower. More people. Uh, that's why we use radio. Uh, JC and Betty taught us that. You can reach a lot more people preaching one time and it covers the whole nation. One time covers the nation. That's going to cut down on that cost, but they're still, still so hard to do. Now, now let's look at some other things. Where are we going to go? We've been told to go into all the world. All of the world. Every single bit of it. Um, this is where the major religions of the world are. It's kind of hard to read that. The, the, uh, you can see... Uh, I'm, try, I'm, trying, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Uh, mostly Protestant religions in the United States. Um, mostly Roman Catholic. You got down... Uh, Mexico and South America and then you've got uh, Islam over in Africa and Northern Africa um, you've got Hinduism in India if you're going over to the side a little little bit um, over here um, you've got your uh, Buddhism uh, different Chinese religions usually animism all through China and uh, the list goes on, but what I want you to notice is where the Christians are. Where the, the uh, Protestant Christians are is right here, and here, and here. Catholicism, here, and then you've got native religions right in this area, and then, and then Catholicism right here. Uh, the, pretty much the rest of the world um, doesn't know about God. Pretty much the rest of the world is heavily populated with other kinds of religions. Now let's look at uh, how many people are in these countries. Uh, China has 1.2 billion people. India has a billion. I think that number is more now. United States, this is the surprising one. We did, a lot of people don't realize how many people are in the United States. 276 million. Indonesia, 212. That's a Muslim uh, country. Uh, 212 million Muslims. Uh, Brazil, uh, Pakistan, uh, Russia, Bangladesh, which that's real crazy because Bangladesh is not that big. Bangladesh is very, very densely populated. And then Japan, also densely populated. This shows the, the uh, uh, density of all these, these countries. Where are most of the people at? The darker the colors are, the more people there are. So where are most of the people in the world? You tell me. Where are they? They're in Asia. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to get to, we should be going to Asia. And you say, Joey, you know, we, we can't all go to Asia. That, that's true. Uh, and, and, or you might be saying, well, Joey, you just want us to go to Asia because you're going to Asia. But what I, what I want you to do is I want you to go to Asia. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I'm doing. And why am I doing that? That's where the people are. That's where the people are. Now, we have, we have lots of other places to go. And I've been to other countries too. But we predominantly work in Asia. Why do I predominantly work in Asia? Another thing that was taught to me by J.C. and Betty Cho. That's where most of the people are. You put those two lists. I mean, to put the two charts together. World religions and density. Where are most of the people that don't believe in Jesus Christ and where are most of the people at? <laughs> Asia. <laughs> there, it's, it's Asia. That's why we go there. Okay, let me give you some more crazy numbers. Okay, 2.1% of all church members in the U.S. have traveled on short-term missions outside the U.S. Now, this is, I put in quotation church members because this is all uh, of Protestant de denominations. This is a number that was just given out. 
I, I would dare say that our within the brotherhood numbers are going to be a very close reflection of everything that we're going to look at here. Um, it's probably going to be real close to that. 1.5 million U.S. Christians uh, and U.S. Christians are going on short-term missions. And uh, most of those are high school and college students. So most of the people who are going on these trips are young. Why are they doing that? Because that's the time we're wanting to learn, we're wanting to explore. A lot of older people want to send the younger people out because they want them to grow in their spirituality. Uh, it's a good thing, and at the same time, it's also like, you know, everybody needs to go on a mission trip one time so you can be a better Christian. Well, once again, the motivation is not exactly where it needs to be. It needs to be on evangelizing the lost. But anyway, most people uh, are in that age range. Uh, most of these trips average to one and a half to two weeks long. That's what we mean by a short-term mission trip. Uh, 22% of these people that, that uh, have been on these trips went with a group of 11 to 15 people. So we're going with a large group of people. So you're going to get up and you're going to go to some country. You're going to help. You're going to go in a large group. Uh, I'm trying real hard not to go into uh, the biblical patterns and talk about how they did it in the Bible, but I'll just, just throw this out there and go right back into it. You don't see that in the Bible. I'll just say that. You don't see groups of 15, 20 people go traveling together. You only, you only find it uh, one time where there was a large group when they were all trying to get to Jerusalem and they had funds with them. Uh, and it's probably, that is probably the reason why there were so many together. You wouldn't want to put that much money on one person. But anyway, 22%, uh, 11 to 15 people, 17% went with a group of 6 to 10, 16 with a group of, of uh, 16 to 20. So what we're saying is most of the people are in a group from 6 to 20 uh, different people all going together. Okay, so are you ready? We're about to give you some more numbers. Okay, number one mission point in the world, where do you think it is? When we're talking about from the United States, where do you think the number one mission point in the world is? Country, not, not a city or anything. What country? Huh? Yes. Mexico. Mexico. Number one mission point in the world. Okay. They, uh, Dominican Republic. Sorry. The Dominica Republic. A lot of people don't know about this place. <laughs> <laughs> there could be all kinds of typos in here. The next one is Canada. Aren't these interesting? Aren't they interesting? Okay. Next one is Honduras. The next one is Jamaica. The next one is Guatemala. Then we've got the United Kingdom getting a little bit further away. Okay, let's go back to our charts. Let's, let's look at several factors on these charts. What kind of nations are these? What do they predominantly believe in these nations? Catholic. Most of them are Catholic. Have they heard of Jesus Christ? Now, now I know, please understand me, uh, the Catholic religion has added lots of things, lots of things to Scripture. But do they know about Jesus Christ? They do. Have they been exposed to a form of Christianity? Yes, most of them. Most of them have. Um, but that's we're not. I don't really think that that's even the reason why these are the number one um, mission points. Why do you think these are the number one p mission points? Close. Close. I mean, uh, Mexico, and then man, I'm going to go on a mission trip. Let's go to Canada. Let's go to Canada, because there's lots of people in Canada that don't know about Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry, I'm being a little bit sarcastic right there. I know, I know everybody in the world needs to know. We've, we've, we've been told that. We've been told that. But now you know. Most people are going to Mexico, so where are you going to go next? I hope that your answer is not Mexico. Why? Because Mexico's covered. Mexico's covered. Okay. Let's look at some more things. Uh, Costa Rica. Now we'll get to China. That's, that's good. China should be number one. India should be number one. Either one of those. Okay. India's number 15. China's number nine. What I'm trying to show you is that we're going based on convenience. Based on convenience. They're close. 
Now, I know a lot of these guys uh, were young. They're, they're just getting out of high school. You want to send them on a mission trip. They want to get some experience. Let's say, like with my family, I have brought them, I brought them to Peru with me. I was trying to teach them about missions. I was trying to give them a good taste of it. And I needed to go to Peru. That was a good place for them to go. So I just made the numbers jump up big time for Peru. Um, Peru, the number one mission point in South America. Um, what I'm trying to say is it's not wrong to go to one of these places. But what, what, what's happening, what's happening is we grow up going to Mexico. Because I went to Mexico when I was a kid. My dad brought me there. I, I did, not really, I'm just saying this. Um, this is what we do. Let's say my dad, he brought me to Mexico and, and he taught me how to do mission work. And he, or he brought me on this team of 15 or 20 people and we go to this place and we work in Mexico. That's good to expose people and teach them how to do missions, but what's happening is we're not graduating from that and going on to do the stuff that's more like we find in the Bible. You know what we graduate to? We graduate to, I'm the guy that's going to be bringing 15 or 20 people into the number one mission point in America. You see what I'm saying? We're not training people and then they go out into these new places. We're just training people to keep going to the same places. Does that make sense? Am I clear when I say that? Um, this, this is just some other stuff that I thought was interesting. Uh, top 15 short-term mission destinations. We just looked at those. The top 15 study abroad destinations. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with this, but uh, or how it affects anything. But the top 15 Protestant long-term mission destinations. Mexico is number one, and that one as well. Brazil is way up there. Uh, India once again at number 15. But the top 15 tourist destination, destinations of U.S. travelers, this is what I thought was so interesting. What's number one? <laughs> Mexico. What's number two? Canada. That was number three on the short-term missions. Uh, United Kingdom, the, the one that, that real strangely made it onto the list there. At number seven of short-term mission destinations, I would have never thought that United Kingdom would, would be on the, in the top 15 in all the nations in the world. Well, I think that tourist destination one affects that. Do you see what I'm saying? Do y'all, do y'all think so? I mean, you can't really find out that information, but I don't know. Out of all the nations in the world, that's kind of strange to me. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the stuff that gets me right here. If you, if, if, we can't really just go on that uh, because we have to look at the density of the nations and, and spread out the missionaries all over the world. If we're going to reach all these people, if we spread it out or if we go by how many people are in the nation by how many missionaries are going, China receives one missionary per 50,000 people. Would you say we need to send a few more people to China? I would think so. If you go to China in the next year and you want to and you want to reach all of China, you better reach fifty thousand people. Fifty thousand people. And these are all the denom- denomination. You know, we're not talking about the Church of Christ. We're not talking about the church. These are just all. Christianity in general. Does that make sense? So that number is going to get a little bit higher about how many people you need to reach when you go over there. A lot higher. Mongolia receives one per 875 people. Now here's the one that really gets me. If you want to go to the Bahamas and you want to make it worthwhile based on how many other missionaries are going, you better study the Bible with 18 people. 18 people. Do you see what I'm saying? Every year, every year we send enough people to the Bahamas that they can hold personal Bible studies with 18 people and the whole country will be reached. Meanwhile, 50,000 people, 50,000 people are just sitting there waiting on somebody to teach them. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? You want to go to Belize, just below Mexico? One per 19. 
And the list could go on and on and on of these nations that we've talked about. Only 13% of short-term missionaries, STMs, short-term missionaries, go to the 1040 window. Y'all know what the 1040 window is? That is, uh, let's see, longitude is up. This latitude, right? Is that right? Latitude. Uh, the 10 degree and 40 degree lines of latitude, and that is the middle of the earth. I, I can go back to, well, I won't do that. Anyway, it's the place basically where I showed you on the map where all the people are. <laughs> right there in the middle. If you've got your whole earth right here, it's right through the middle, right there. The majority of the people live in that place, and the majority of the people are worship other false gods. Majority of those people. Okay, so only 13% of all missionaries, people going on short-term mission trips, are even going to that place. 3.5% of short-term missionaries travel to the least evangelized world. So out of all of the people going on these mission trips, only 3.5% of them are going to where they're needing somebody to go. Does that make sense? 12.5%, I don't know what that is, travel to somewhat evangelized places. Somewhat evangelized places. 84% of short-term missionaries go to the 33% of the world that is most evangelized. What am I trying to tell you? We're going where people already know. That's where we're going. And why do we do that? Have y'all ever done this? Uh, we do, we, we do this in, uh, in stateside missions as well. You find out, hey man, did, did you take your, where did you take your youth group last year? You were a youth minister. Have you ever asked that question <laughs> to another? <laughs> I mean, I've had people ask me, hey man, where'd y'all go last year? We're trying to find a mission point. We're trying to, go, yeah, yeah, have you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't, we're trying to help these kids out. We're trying to help a, a place out. But what happens that, okay, let's, East Point, Florida, Apalachicola. There's only one church down there. James, Lee's, James Lee is down there. He's a graduate of Heritage. It's a great work. You go door knocking down there. All of a sudden, that name somehow gets out there. And every youth group in North Alabama, every youth group in Lauderdale County goes down there that summer, then the next summer. And they knock the doors like crazy. They knock every single door. And, Every week, a different group comes down there and knocks those doors. Do you see what I'm saying? We do that here, and we do it overseas. We find a spot that works, and then we all want to go to that spot. And then you have this other problem, and I hate to talk about the nasty part of mission work. Then you've got some other guy that's like, I want to be a missionary. I want to do this. And so he goes over somewhere where there's already something going on. There's already a school there. And people are being trained and they're going out all over uh, this country. And this guy's like, I want that. And so he comes in there and he tries to take that over. Have y'all ever experienced that? Uh, <laughs> any of you guys who uh, have done a mission work? I want to take that over. And... How can I do that? I know I can go over there and I can get in real good with the people that are already there. What in the world? That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. You know what, you know what a better thing would be? If this guy's like, I want to be a missionary. I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to work somewhere. Go somewhere different. <laughs> go somewhere different and start a school somewhere else. Pretty simple, huh? Pretty simple. Okay. I don't even know if I have anything left on here. Okay. Um, I don't have to go into all the mass evangelism stuff. What I, what I hope that everybody understands about this is after I've given you all the, the charts, all the numbers, and all this kind of stuff, I want you to ask yourself, where do I really really, really need to go. And that's when the question comes, really? You want me to go there? Because when you start asking yourself, where do I really, really need to go? It's going to put you in some crazy places. It's going to put you in uncomfortable places. 
It's going to put you in dangerous places. And the one that gets all the, the young people, the ones who are going on this trip, is going to take you in places that are not fun. Not fun. It's going to take you in places where all your friends aren't going to be there with you. So that you can all go on your big, great 20-person mission trip and have so much fun together and all bond and fellowship and have all this great fun. And then, oh yeah, the, the church, we came here to, to help. That's sarcasm again. Um, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, but that's what we do. That is what we do. Uh, the, the goal of m most of these short-term mission trips stateside, and then if you go, especially if you go on a big group somewhere, the goal is, is for the group. Man, I've got some books. <laughs> um, I was doing a lot of research uh, for my practicum. And uh, they were these mission training books for youth leaders. And uh, I won't tell you what book it is, you know, but, but, but you, you read through the book and it's telling you all the stuff that you need to do to help this group out on their mission trip. And uh, not once, not once does it mention a single person outside of the group that you're trying to work with. The final chapter of the book that gives the big emotional plea, you know, and gives the good heartwarming story where you feel so good about it, talks about a story of a conversion. I thought, oh, good, we're going to get, a, we're actually going to convert somebody. It was a person within the group that was converted. <laughs> Come on. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Take the numbers, take the numbers, take the charts, and, and, and then I, I did want to say this. Uh, you may tell me, well, Paul didn't get out a chart of density, populations, and numbers of Christians, and all that kind of stuff, and he didn't kind of flip through there and say, well, there's nobody, you know, I need to go here. He didn't do anything like that. Paul just kind of went. Spirit led him. Y'all know that one time while Paul's trying to go back through, uh, wait, where is it? Asia, it'd be Asia Minor today. Um, Turkey. He's trying to, uh, Turkey today. He's trying to uh, go back into those regions. He'd already been through those regions. And what did it say? It said the Holy Spirit forbid them to go or, or did not permit them to go. They were unable to push further into that continent where they had already been. They'd already been there. And then all of a sudden he gets this vision. The vision of Cornelius, of the man who's telling him to come. And then they move to another continent. They move into Europe. Had the gospel been to Europe yet? I guess not. It, was it important for Paul to continue to go further where people were not Christians? Yes. Then you start looking, and Paul apparently got it at this point, and the Spirit didn't have to push him any further to do this. Next, you see him making plans like, well, I'm going to go to Rome. And then I'm going to go to Spain. And then I'm going to go. And you don't know where he's going to go after that. That's all we have. Do you see what I'm saying? He didn't stay and keep working in the places. He would go back and visit them and make sure they're still doing okay. And, they, and he was hoping that they could give him some money to spring him on further to go to some other place where people had not heard. That's what we need to do in our mission work. If you want to be effective, if you want to reach all those millions of people that are dying, those thousands, literally thousands of people who are dying every day, we need to get where the people have not been already. We need to go to new places. We need to start new works. We need to be a little more effective with what we have, the manpower that we have. Let's say you got two people going somewhere, and then you got two more people who want to go. We see this in the Bible, too. They split up, and they go to different places. Rather than taking four somewhere and having a good old time together, and it's going to be real funny, and they're going to get to laugh a whole lot, they split up, and they go in different places. Cover more ground. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Um, 
I'll finish with one, one short story. Uh, it's actually barely even a story. Uh, I was, I was uh, uh, talking to some guys one time who I knew were, they were not Christians. And I'm pretty sure that most of the Christian, uh, most of Christianity they experienced uh, had rubbed them the wrong way. They were pretty anti-Christian. Uh, but I had been placed in, in a certain place where I was able to talk to them, just to hang out with them for a little while. And, uh, and so I was talking to them about things, and I thought, wow, this would be a good opportunity for them to maybe see a different side of Christianity. I, you know, I was hoping that, that uh, you know, maybe I could be a nice guy, and they would think a little bit differently about Christians in general. I don't know. I, you know... It, it didn't hurt to try talking to them about things. And uh, they, they were just asking me stuff and ask, asking what I did. And I told them I was a youth minister and I made uh, mission trips uh, over into different countries. And I thought, wow, this is an opportunity to talk to them about some of the, the things that people do overseas. The people that I've met, and particularly in Burma. I've been doing a lot of work in Burma. And I've seen people in Burma sacrifice and when I mean sacrifice, I mean sacrifice. Sign their names onto documents that say they'll take the punishment of us if we, if we uh, preach the gospel and somebody is baptized and that punishment will be death. Sign their name onto a piece of paper. We've, we've watched them do this. Um, we've gone to the school sessions where one brother written there this time, he asked, Where is, where's brother so-and-so? They killed him last year. We're talking about people who are sacrificing their lives, not sacrificing a little bit of their time, a little bit of their money, sacrificing everything that they have for Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, this is real Christianity. I can tell this guy about it. I can tell him about it. And uh, so I did. I was saying, man, these guys, you know, I'm telling them a couple of examples about it. And, you know, they give their lives to God. They're dying for Jesus over there. And his answer... Well, then why do you go? <laughs> and, I, and I realized, wow, this guy's not going to understand this. He is thinking on a human, a very humanistic level. And that level is, what you're telling me is that you're going over to some country and telling these people about a God that doesn't exist and they're dying for him. So what you're doing is you're getting people killed over there for no reason. Why are you going? And that was the first time it really hit me. Like, whoa. That's not going to work with this guy. I just stopped. And I just said, you wouldn't understand. Maybe I should have pushed further. I don't know. But I didn't know what to say to this guy. But I want, I want you to ask yourself. Are you going to go over to some country and tell somebody about Jesus Christ and watch them give their give their life for him. The reason that I do it is because I know that guy is, could not be more wrong. I'm giving these people hope. Actually, actually, it's not me, but you know, understand what I'm saying. They have hope now. They have Jesus Christ. And it's worth anything. It's worth everything to them. They'll sacrifice anything that they have to because it is real. So, once again, where are you going to go once you figure that out? Really? You want me to go there? Now, you're not asking me that now. Who are you asking? Talk to God about it. Really, God? Is that where you want me to go? And then, back to the first slide. Go. Thank you.